Hello folks, and welcome to today's webinar, Compost and Soil, Restoring Health and Rebalancing the Climate with Calla Rose Ostrander and Jean Bonatal. This is the fourth webinar in the on-farm composting and compost use webinar series. I'm Linda Bilsons Brolis of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative, and I'll be your facilitator for today. We are at the wrong end of the presentation, sorry guys. Um, a quick shout out to uh, a couple of my ILSR colleagues who are helping with this series. Sophia Jones will be providing technical support throughout the webinar, and Clarissa Libertelli is a talented artist who's creating beautiful artwork for a composting initiative, including this beautiful graphic. So thank you both. For those not familiar with our work, ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste, enhance local soils, create community development opportunities, and protect the climate. Our focus is to catalyze distributed food waste composting options that include home, community, and on-farm scales. You can find more about our work and peruse our wealth of resources, including reports, infographics, webinars, podcasts, a policy library, and map on our website. If you go to ilsr.org forward slash composting, you'll see a composting resources drop-down menu on the right-hand side of the screen. This webinar series is being brought to you through, the, through our involvement with the Million Acre Challenge, of which ILSR is a founding member. The Million Acre Challenge is a collaborative project that is supporting farmers in implementing healthy soils practices and regenerative agriculture on 1 million acres of farmland in Maryland and the Chesapeake region, with the goal to do this by 2030. Healthy soils practices, including the skillful on-farm production and use of compost, have tremendous potential to improve farm resilience and profitability, while also providing critical ecosystem services at a crucial time for our farms and our planet. We are at a turning point for agriculture worldwide. Soil health can be the foundation for a transformation to a new agroecology rooted in ancient wisdom and integrating the most innovative science. The Million Acre Challenge is inspiring farmers, eaters, and policymakers to transform our food system by networking farmers into peer to peer learning cohorts examining the connections between management practices and healthy soils outcomes, analyzing the costs, risks, and benefits of transition to regenerative production, educating consumers on the importance and potential of regenerative agriculture, and helping support farmer-friendly policies that incentivize and catalyze regenerative production. So this, uh, the first three webinars in the on-farm composting and compost use series focused on best management practices for creating high quality compost. The final three webinars, including this one, will focus on what to do with compost once you have it and the potential benefits and considerations for compost use. The next webinar will be on November 16th and will feature Janie Merner Senecal of Earthcare Farm in Rhode Island and Dr. Greg Vanilo of Virginia Tech University. Greg will cover compost quality parameters that are important to test, and Janie will talk about how Earthcare Farm monitors compost quality and how this profits their farm. You can register for that session on our website. But now uh, let's do some polls to get to know each other. So you're gonna be able to answer these questions from your GoToWebinar control panel. So question number one, where are you participating from? Select one of the following, Northeast US, Southern US, Midwestern US, Western US, or outside of the US. We're happy to see quite a few folks from the outside of the US, but you may not be on the line right now. I'll give it a couple more seconds. Okay. And these are the results, primarily Northeastern US, but a good mix of other folks and even a few folks from outside of the US. So welcome to you all. Next question. Are you currently composting? Yes, you're already composting. No, you're interest, no, but you're interested in starting. No, but you're interested in supporting others in composting or something other. And if you select other, please uh, add to the chat what that means. Just a couple more minutes, uh, seconds. Alrighty, let's see what the results are. All right, that's fabulous. Uh, 
large majority already composting. Hopefully we'll be able to give you some tools to uh, um, better communicate about the benefits of what you're doing um, and put that compost to use. And thank you to those that are supporting others in composting and other, I'll check out, if you add to the chat, I'll check that out, what you enter later. All right, so last question. What describes, what best describes your affiliation? And I know you all answered these questions in the registration, but just so you all can see who's on the line. So we have farmer, composter, farm service provider, and then a really big category, researcher, government, or nonprofit, and then other business or other. And again, if you select other, we would welcome knowing what that means in the chat. All right, just a couple more seconds. All righty, we've got a pretty good mix of a lot of folks. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to introduce our first presenter. Uh, actually, before I do that, um, a few housekeeping notes. You will have noticed that everyone is in listen only mode. We will be taking some questions at the end of the first presenter's uh, presentation um, and then more at the end. Uh, but please enter your questions as they come up in the GoToWebinar control panel box that should be on your screen, which you just use to answer the polling questions. And this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent to you in the next few days. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Calla Rose Ostrander is a strategic advisor to individuals and organizations dedicated to the well-being of people and planet. She specializes in climate change and agricultural policy, science communications, and movement building. Since 2013, she has worked to support the advancement of carbon farming, compost production, and climate beneficial material economies in California. In partnership with John Wick and the partner organizations of the Marin Carbon Project, Calla Rose has supported the successful scaling of regenerative agriculture to the state scale through strategic organization, economic development, local and state policy, and communications. So without further ado, uh, Calla Rose, we're gonna hand things over to you. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, well, thanks so much for having me today. And I am a really big fan of what ILSR does and the types of workshops that you offer. Um, I am both excited and slightly embarrassed to see that 80% of you already compost as a lot of this presentation uh, was meant for folks who might be curious in policy, but uh, don't really know how to compost. So. I welcome you in um, maybe just sitting back and enjoying being part of such a robust club and maybe coming away with some more information about how to communicate the benefits of what you are already doing. And for those of you who are not already composting, uh, I hope that you feel inspired to do so or to support compost production after today. So I'm gonna uh, move over here to my PowerPoint um, and then, uh, feel free to, of course, type questions in as we go, and I will answer questions um, at the end. I'm happy to get super nitty gritty and science nerdy in the questions. I'm not going to do that so much uh, in the presentation. So let's see if I can get this to work. All right. So here we go. Um, All right, so are you seeing uh, my my the PowerPoint now? Yep, looks good and sounds good. Great, okay. Um, so I'm gonna hide my webcam just a second here. All I'm seeing is myself. Um, I did not practice this part. Okay, let's see if I can do this without seeing my slides. All right, compost basics, some considerations for policy and practice. 
Um, so we're going to start here with uh, the Earth. This is this blue planet we all know that is floating in space, circling a star that's in a galaxy that may or may not be expanding or contracting or traveling very fast. We're always learning more about it. But I really want to place today's conversation about compost within the larger context of how life on planet Earth works. So we are all solar powered. In fact, we're star powered. Um, and that uh, energy comes to the earth in the form of sunlight, which is absorbed by plants. Um, and plants take that sunlight and combine it with water, this beautiful resource we have, and carbon from the air to make sugar or carbohydrates. So just again, as a reminder, all of the carbon and carbohydrates comes from the atmosphere. Uh, and this is the basis of the carbon cycle on our planet. The, the plants eat the sunlight and the carbon, the animals eat the plants, we eat plants and animals. Um, that sort of fundamental life cycle that is driven by carbon on our planet has been very disrupted by human activity where we've put a lot more carbon uh, from the earth and from the fossil pools into the atmosphere. And that's really, as we know, destabilizing our climate system. I think a lot of you may know as well that the, the earth, the oceans and the forests uh, and the deserts, they all sequester carbon. Wetlands, coastal systems, seagrasses, anything that's alive and photosynthesizing is uh, bringing that carbon into its body and storing it in the ecosystem around it. Uh, after all that's done, we have about 44% of anthropogenic carbon emissions left over in the atmosphere. And that's what's causing this rise in climate uh, change, uh, rapid climate change. I like to think about agriculture in the way that John Wick does, which is when we engage in agriculture, when we engage in composting, we're engaging in a positive process of moving that excess carbon in the atmosphere back into the soil and plant pools or the terrestrial and pedosphere pools of carbon, essentially saying we're taking that atmospheric carbon and turning it into produce to food, fuel, fiber, and flora. Carbon, as we know, is the keystone in our system. All the other major life cycles revolve around it, connect to it, or are influenced by it at the core. Um, and I think it's important that when we talk about carbon, we're not just thinking about a pollutant that causes climate change, but we're thinking about the fundamental building block of life on our planet. Uh, everything else organizes around carbon. And so when we support that transfer of atmospheric carbon back into plants and the soil, we are also supporting the recycling of water uh, because water sort of follows carbon. And what do I mean by that? Well, you get more carbon in the atmosphere, you get more heat in the atmosphere. More heat in the atmosphere holds more water. We get these really intense storms. California just experienced a huge atmospheric river. We got a ton of water dumped on us, and that's largely because there's more water that can stay up in the atmosphere. Similarly, when there's more carbon in the soil, the soil holds more water. Uh, vegetation then can grow more, and the evapotranspiration rates begin to attract small water cycles with grasses and trees. Uh, in the Western United States, 60% of our precipitation actually comes in the form of uh, small water cycles that are governed by soil carbon and vegetation. So again, carbon, building block of life, water follows carbon. And then the exciting thing is also, when you get more carbon and more water in the soil, the soil's electromagnetic um, capacity or electric charge changes. The cation exchange capacity changes. What this does is it allows more nutrients to stick around. So it increases nutrient efficiency if you're adding nutrients to your soil, and it also makes more nutrients naturally available. Uh, so it both increases the natural availability and increases the ability of the soil to hold more added nutrients. So here again, you can see this sort of stacking function, carbon, water, nutrients. Um, and now each of these nutrients has its own cycles and is very different, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. 
Uh, but it's important to understand the fundamental building blocks of this biological or biogeochemical cycle. Um, and it's important to understand that they're synergistic and that they're stacking. They're not linear. Um, so while we are in a state of entropic collapse from a climate system perspective, there is potential for synergy and or healing within the system as well because of the stacking function. So this brings us back to compost. Compost is an incredible way to transition carbon that is part of a living body that has now died back into the carbon cycle in a positive manner. Rather than burning it and putting it back up in the atmosphere um, or embalming it uh, and covering it in lots of strange fluids, um, we are returning the carbon and the nutrients in those biological bodies, anything that was ever alive can technically be composted, back into the system in a way that feeds life. It's important also to note, and I know many of you know this, but for those of you who are considering policy or those of you who are new to buying compost, it's really important to understand that it's gone through these temperature phases. Now, if you're using a vermicompost, obviously that's different. The materials are being digested by worms or a biodigester. But if you're making compost in a compost pile, it does need to go through these stages of heat. And those stages of heat are governed by microbes. Um, this slide shows the growth of those microbes over time as those temperatures increase. And what happens, and I like to quote um, a wonderful doctor, PhD, Dr. Gary Anderson from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs is, essentially what happens is you get this flurry of microbial activity and the microbes just go after everything. They eat everything. It's like putting all your dog's favorite treats in a bowl and mixing in some broccoli. They're gonna eat the broccoli along with the treats. So those microbes just kind of go crazy. They eat everything. And then as each stage of this sort of digestion process within the soil completes, one phase of microbes dies off and the next one comes online. After that thermophilic phase, things start to cool down. It's important to note that because oftentimes people have had bad experiences uh, by putting compost that is too hot or has not fully um, matured onto their uh, field. So you really do need to make sure that your compost product has gone through these processes to kill off weed seeds and pathogens and has been cooled, so to speak, down and matured and stabilized so you don't put those hot nutrients uh, onto your plants. What compost is not, it is not manure. So a pile of manure that is just left there to dry out is not really compost. We don't really know if it's gone through that composting process. It probably still has weed seeds in it. Um, it may have pathogens in it that are undesirable. Uh, and we really have to be careful with just spreading manures because you can be spreading these things also, the nutrients in manure are not stabilized. They haven't been bound up with carbon, so they're more mobile. This means that spreading manure can cause water quality issues, as well as some uh, short-term air quality issues. Compost is not rotting food scraps. It's not the leaves piled up in the back of your yard, and it's not biosolids. All of these things can be composted, but they are in and of themselves not compost. Um, as I was saying, compost is a biologically stable form of broken down organic material that has been reshaped and digested into something new. Uh, again, I'm just gonna say this because if you are maybe a farmer and you're wanting to compost, there may be con some concerns about water quality on your property if you, have a, if you live in an area that's uh, of a concern to the EPA. Um, it's important to really understand and remember that a lot of folks are not educated in the difference between a, a synthetic or more mobile uh, nitrogen source, which can be in both a synthetic um, fertilizer or in a manure, and um, more stabilized nutrients, including phosphorus, uh, that are going to be in compost. Compost does contain those nutrients, but they are organic. They've been bound up with carbon, and it takes the microbial activity in the soil and the plants themselves to break those nutrients and that bond to the carbon apart so the plants can use them. This is just really important, and I know it sounds a little bit silly, but a lot of folks often don't know the difference, and so they think that the types of nutrients you're getting in compost are in the same form as you're getting in like a fertilizer you might buy from the store 
or in manure, when in reality, these nutrients have been uh, bonded with carbon and are now in a different form that creates what's more like a slow release fertilizer over time. If you're buying compost, the two things you really need to watch out for are quality. Was this a finished process product? Did it go through all the stages of microbial processing? Uh, can they show, uh, can the composter show that it has gone through those stages? Are they certified uh, by an, a reputable agency or do you have some way of talking to them to understand what their process is and make sure that they've really gone through that? Um, were the feedstocks they're using free from toxins? Some toxins don't break down. Uh, many do, but there are some forever chemicals that stay present even through the composting process. Uh, and there have been some bad batches of compost out there. So again, if you're buying compost commercially, it really is important to test it and make sure that you're not putting out a product that has those toxins in it. Similarly, if you're gonna be making your compost on farm uh, and you might be say accepting feedstocks from a highway tree trimming or um, maybe your county um, has a, a brush clearing and they're gonna bring in the brush for you, you probably wanna to talk to the county on if that brush has been treated with uh, pesticides and what chemicals specifically it's been treated with. Uh, many of those chemicals will break down in the composting process, but some won't. So again, if you're aware that there may be chemicals in one of your feedstocks, you do wanna get that compost tested before you spread it everywhere. The other thing to be aware of um, is the carbon nitrogen ratio. And because you all compost, you know that you have to put a mix of both carbon and nitrogen into that compost recipe to start with. Um, again, unless you're using worms and they just eat everything. Um, but that carbon and nitrogen ratio is influenced by the type of nitrogenous feedstocks that go into it. So um, chicken manure, pig manure, human manure are gonna be higher in nutrients than a compost that's just from green wastes. We get this question a lot from the Marin Carbon Project and people are really concerned about putting a high nutrient compost out on rangelands, which typically do not have any soil amendments go on them. The compost that the Marine Carbon Project used was actually a green waste based compost, organic certified, uh, so no toxins and a low nitrogen uh, compost. So high in carbon, low in nitrogen and low in the other nutrients. So very low in phosphorus as well, coming from a plant based feedstock. So understanding both the CN ratios that go into making your compost and the CN ratio that exists at the end of the composting process. So you can make sure to either target those composts to the right crop uh, and or if, you know, if you're buying compost that you know you're gonna get the nutrient values you're looking for in that product. Uh, compost is a unique human and microbial gift. It's our way of contributing to that larger life cycle, that larger carbon cycle. Um, and it's unique to us. There are really only two places in nature where composting happens. Um, one of them is in areas with repeated or regular flooding uh, that a delta, a river delta, in warmer climates may build up piles of organic matter that compost. Um, and that's pretty rare, but it does happen. In Australia, there's a bird called a brush turkey, which consciously builds piles of organic matter to create that composting process so that it can lay its eggs in there and incubate the eggs in the heat of the pile. There's the turkey. I just put it in there because it's pretty cool. Look at his pile, it's huge. So the turkey makes its pile by gathering materials. There are a lot of different ways to make compost. And the right way is really based on what type of considerations you have. What are your space constraints? What's your climate? Is it a really wet climate, a cold climate, a dry climate? Um, do you have access to water in that space? What are the feedstocks you're gonna be using? Is it manure? Uh, is it household food scraps? Um, do you have leaves or brush that you're bringing in? Are you composting crops that maybe you are taking out? Uh, so understanding those feedstocks and then understanding the environmental regulations uh, in your area is going to determine what is the appropriate way for you to compost. So um, everything from a small pile to biodynamic to large windrows uh, to covered piles, um, there are so many methods. You can get into Bokashi composting, boutique, vermicomposting. It really is gonna depend on if you're using it for yourself, what feedstocks you have, your needs, or if you are making it, what the needs of your market are. 
So again, most of you compost, but I just wanted to show you the range of the types of composting processes that are out there. On the left is a uh, commercial vermicomposting and on the right is a small at-home vermicompost uh, structure, which I um, got off of Etsy and it's, I really like it. So here's a vermicomposting system. Um, this photo comes from ILSR and their community composting. Here you're looking at looks like to me like a uh, maybe a three or four bin system of bringing in the um, materials and turning them. So something can be small like this, this can go in a community space or on a farm. Here's a biodynamic pile. They're sort of like the lasagna, <laughs> the, um, maybe the five-star lasagnas of the compost world, very carefully made um, and um, constructed piles of different materials um, that are chosen uh, for different mixes and different reasons. Um, you can find a local biodynamic practitioner in your area if you're interested in learning about this style of composting. I highly encourage it. it produces a beautiful product. There's a really simple static or turn pile on farm, which can just be a way of taking, you know, what you've got in your tractor, um, manure, moving it over to a pile, um, adding your carbonaceous materials and turning it uh, fairly regularly until you get through that um, thermophilic phase and your compost starts to cool down. These are commercial aerated static piles. And I've seen some really cool smaller community aerated static piles recently. Um, but in these piles, they're covered with a biological filter, oftentimes a mulch on top, while air is run through them. And so they're aerated uh, via those tubes of air at the bottom and they're not, they don't need to be turned. These are some extended aerated piles in a bunker at a municipal system. And these are turned windrows at a commercial scale. So very large uh, commercial compost. I think this might come from Blossom Valley in California. Um, the most important thing to understand is if you are buying or selling compost, it is really good for you to take an uh, official certification course. Uh, the US Composting Council, ILSR, Master Gardeners, um, and I'll offer uh, courses for you to take to learn how to do these things and also offer various forms of certifications um, and or ways to make sure that your compost is tested and safe. Uh, if you're using on farm just the stuff you're making yourself, I still would recommend um, taking classes where you can. Uh, and there's a lot of great videos online as well. Um, but I think one of the biggest problems we see at least on the policy side of things, is that people will sell stuff they're calling compost. It's really a bad product and it may give compost a bad name. Um, often, if you're selling an uncomposted biosolid, there's been some really bad results from that. Again, you can see areas that have taken in a toxin that hasn't been able to be decomposed and a toxin going out in compost to spread all over your field, and that can be problematic. Uh, so, I really do talk about compost less as like if you're doing a backyard compost pile or you're a farmer a compost is like another animal it's or if you're a household it's like a pet i don't describe it as taking care of a plant i really describe it as something that you need to be mindful of uh you know watch how it's doing um maybe a low maintenance pet or a low maintenance animal but you really do need to pay attention to it and you're going to learn through trial and error so i would really encourage everybody who has not done one of these courses to, to take a look at doing them or at least learn all you can online. Um, this question came up when we were preparing for this webinar, which is how is compost used? So um, there are varieties of ways to use compost and the appropriate application requires understanding the needs and limitations of the landscape, um, the crops nutrient needs and the land manager's desired outcomes. So, um, Application rates are going to vary, and they're going to vary a lot. Uh, those CN ratios of those compost applied are also going to vary a lot. I, I've heard questions about like, well, gosh, you need a lot of compost to put out on rangelands, but we are only compost if you're only spreading a quarter of an inch or a half an inch of a high carbon compost. You're very unlikely to be creating any sort of nutrient load that would be concerning. However, if you're spreading a manure-based compost in a thick in a thick manner, you're going to be supplying a certain level of nutrients. That would be great for crops, perhaps, or for an irrigated pasture growing alfalfa. 
plants that have higher needs for those types of nutrients. It's also really important to understand what your soil is doing. If you have too much phosphorus, if you have too much potassium, you may really need to look at not putting on as much compost or changing the type of compost in the feedstocks it was made from that you're going to use. A manure-based compost would not be good if you have a high potassium soil. A green waste compost may be helpful and add some nutrients, but you would still really need to watch that. So I always recommend getting a soil test and choosing your application rates in consultation with an agronomist or learning a lot about that yourself to understand how to match nutrient needs with what's going on in your soil and what that type of compost can help you with. I just put this in here and I know it's obvious and I know a lot of you are not in policy or advocacy, but for a lot of people who haven't thought about compost, they really think it's all the same. They also maybe think that farming is all the same. So it's important to note that this crop is gonna have a very different need for nutrients and uh, than this crop. An irrigated pasture is going to have a very different type of management than non-irrigated rangelands. Um, and how these are managed both in terms of the, how the animals are managed and how soil health and plant species composition are managed are going to be different. Um, and really the answer when it comes to compost is it depends. Depends on a lot of things. Uh, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, are sort of the building blocks of modern agriculture, our chemical agricultural system that has enabled our population to explode far beyond what was ever possible within the Earth's carrying capacity before came about from the synthesis of nitrogen. What we're trying to do in terms of carbon farming or soil health is understand that NPK working is also dependent on there being carbon or C in the soil. Because like if you remember back to the beginning, that stacking function of water and nutrient efficiency all occurs around carbon. So, so the carbon has been the silent ingredient in the NPK ingredient of agriculture. What we're trying to do is to really build awareness back into the fact that while you are managing for nutrients, you also really need to be managing for carbon. And by managing for that carbon, you're going to be able to be more efficient with both your water and your nutrients. Okay, some soil health benefits of compost. They are many, and you probably know most of them. Uh, we add natural fertility um, without risk to water quality or air quality when we add so compost to the soil. Um, increasing compost uh, application can also help change soil structure and increase its ability to absorb and hold water, um, reducing flooding and pooling of water after high rains. Um, it increases how much photosynthetically derived carbon comes into the soil. So this is a point that often confuses folks, but when you add compost to your soil, you're actually adding two types of carbon. One is the carbon that comes with the compost itself. A lot of that carbon is oxidized back into the atmosphere, but some of it's actually stored by the soil microbial community in the soil. The second source of carbon is that photosynthetically derived carbon that the plants are bringing in and storing in the soil. And because the compost helps the soil quality and things like water and nutrients, those plants are able to grow more and to both bring in and store more carbon below ground. So there are two sources of carbon. One is coming from the compost itself and the other one is coming from the atmosphere which the plants move um, via photosynthesis through their bodies and into the soil. Um, compost feeds and houses beneficial microbial populations. There's a lot of work around soil microbes right now and it's something that we just don't know a lot about. There are so many of them. <laughs> I heard someone say that if you read the name of every single known soil microbe without stopping to eat or sleep or drink, it would take you six years. Um, well, so there's a lot, there's a lot of soil microbes. Now the thing is, um, if you're just adding microbes to the soil, but you're not adding um, anything for them to eat or live in, those microbial populations may just die. So it's really hard to say whether compost teas actually work to enhance soil microbial levels, or if they're maybe bringing in something like silica or other benefits to the plants. There's a lot of different research that shows a lot of different things. Um, suffice it to say, when you use compost instead of a tea, 
what you're getting is also food and housing for whatever microbes are coming in with that compost, but also more food and more housing for whatever microbes are already in the soil. And essentially what you really wanna be doing is building up those populations of your existing soil microbes um, and supporting healthy populations with that compost. Because it changes and helps support changes in cation exchange capacity, uh, compost additions can also increase the availability of minerals and other macro and micronutrients to plants from the soil. Again, there's a lot of research being done there, some knowns and a lot of unknowns. But what we do know is that increasing soil health does increase protein contents in plants and can also increase the availability of other micronutrients. The benefits of composting organic materials. And then I'll finish up here. Climate benefits. There are three emissions reductions upstream from avoiding those going into either slurry ponds for manure management um, and or landfills. This is a huge one. We actually have a lot of methane that comes from these sources. Uh, if you turn it into compost, you are both um, reducing that emission and you are then applying some to the soil that helps with sequestration. The other thing is if you're reducing the amount of synthetic fertilizer you use, you are also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And um, we don't think about it, but the process of synthesizing nitrogen takes a tremendous amount of energy. Nitrogen is synthesized in nature by both legumes and lightning bolts. So we're using a lot of energy, which is mostly burning fossil fuels to produce synthetic uh, fertilizers. So when you're able to create natural fertility, you're also offsetting the use of those fertilizers. You're enhancing soil carbon sequestration and you're enhancing um, soil health, which increases the stability of temperature. So you don't get so cold of soils or so hot of soils. And it increases the ability to hold and retain water, both reducing risk from flooding and from drought. So you're working to stabilize that soil system when it's healthy and part of that health can be supported uh, by compost. There's a lot of other benefits. Farmer profitability, if you're making your own compost on site, you may be saving on input costs um, in increasing uh, that type of production. Um, human health, it increases nutrient density in foods. And one thing we don't talk a lot about is using compost instead of synthetics. Um, can really also help farm workers. So if you own your farm and are working on it or you have folks working on it, having them working in fields that have had a mature compost product applied is safer than having them working in a field that maybe manure has been applied in, raw manure, or even a synthetic or chemical-based pesticide or fertilizer. So there's a lot of human health benefits both to the person who's eating the food and to the people who are growing the food. Educational. We find that learning about compost is sort of like a gateway drug, both for children and adults. So in terms of understanding how life works and how death works and how we work with life and death and we work with the natural world, compost is a really great starting point. It's not political. It's not climate change. It's very practical. Uh, it's very understandable. And I haven't met anybody who doesn't like it. Um, if states are really interested in supporting this development of the product, it is a highly underdeveloped marketplace. There's a lot of economic development opportunities that go along with supporting compost, both on farm and at community scales and at the commercial scale. And indeed, all of these things can coexist together. Um, I really love ILSR's work as well as the California Alliance for Community Composting. Composting can bring communities together, create soil and grow food in places that may not have access to those things. It, just to bring us full circle, it really helps us close that loop. Um, it helps us participate with nature. Again, remember that compost doesn't happen on its own, except for very rarely. We can really speed up this transition from death to life and close these big carbon and nutrient loops when we compost. Um, there's a lot of considerations to, to take into account when you are looking at compost, feedstocks, nutrient management, your crop or land or restoration goals. And then if you're in policy, political economic considerations, how might you be supporting this market? How might you be disincentivizing this market? Uh, these are all things to take a look at. Um, this is the end of my presentation, but for those of you who are farmers, I've included some of my favorite resources. Uh, and links here so you can access them through the presentation later. And for those of you who are advocates or policymakers, I've included some of my favorite links here. And with that, I'm going to see if I can stop my screen share. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and take over the controls, uh, but we're, I'm gonna pitch you the first question, Calarose. That was a great presentation. Um, I think some folks are curious about quantifying the carbon sequestration potential of different composts, which I know is a big question because it all depends on local conditions, soil conditions and things like that as well. But I don't know if you have any any response to uh, yeah um let's see so on the types of compost so there's a couple of considerations one is um what is your soil carbon level already so you may be working with a high soil carbon situation um and at some point we do reach a saturation level in terms of the soil's ability to hold carbon that varies and um, for example, in California, it's thought that maybe the saturation rate might be around 12%, but most farmed lands are under 1%, so there's a lot of room to grow. It's a very complicated question, and I'm trying to explain to you why we don't know the answer. Uh, depends on the amount of carbon in your soil. It depends on the other types of practices that are happening. Depends on water availability. Um, and it really depends on um, basically like where you are so your climate your growing season are you in a perennial grassland system are you in um a four season system uh something in the mediterranean is going to grow year round in a mediterranean climate like california something in a northeastern climate that's going to have winter is going to have less of a growing season all of those things are going to influence how much carbon comes into the soil from compost application um, the Comet Planner tool, which is out of Colorado State University, does include compost uh, carbon sequestration benefits for Colorado and California. Um, and there are some studies happening in New Mexico and Arizona uh, that will hopefully produce literature which can be incorporated into that model. If you're really interested in understanding the carbon benefits of compost application or different types of compost applications, I would encourage you to set up a field trial where you have controlled plots and your trial plots and to set up a replicable uh, science experiment to work with your local either ag extension university or community college to do that research the more research we get the more um, we will learn about this um, and because it's highly variable uh, i really don't extrapolate all that much um, beyond what uh, the different studies we have show us um, and what that sort of would lead us to believe in other situations that there is some benefit. I have not seen any study that actually differentiates com uh, carbon sequestration based on the type of compost. So that would be an interesting study to do. Uh, I think there's a lot of questions about native microbes and introduced microbes and their role in that. And then again, there's uh, the climatic consideration. So that was a long answer, but the short answer is no. <laughs> the long answer is, all the things I just said. That's awesome. That was it. That was a perfect answer. And yeah, I've the importance of local field trials um, and helping to shape how local governments support different soil health practices in general, but you know, in this context specifically to compost application. And I wonder if there's any other advice you might offer to folks that want to find a way to bring carbon uh, to field trials into their region. Yeah, well, feel free to reach out to me. We have a, a guidance document from the NRCS for the compost field trials we did in California and Colorado that can be adopted to do field trials. Um, and again, I think working with your local researchers and understanding you know, what their questions are and what your questions are um, is really helpful. So. There is definitely a format to do these trials and um, you can add in different compost types. Um, I can connect you to different researchers who are doing this work in various parts of the United States if you're interested in doing trials. Uh, one thing I would say though, just from the last seven years of doing this is definitely do the trial if you're interested, but also really look at water quality and any sorts of other effects on the system because Right now in the United States, we have much stronger policy drivers around water quality than we do around carbon. And if you're trying to 
get an incentive or get money to do this practice after you've done the experiment, uh, it's much easier to get funding from government uh, sources that are based in water quality than it is for carbon, um, which is very, there is no government funding source for carbon where there's a lot of funding sources for water quality. So looking at water quality and even the upstream benefits, if you have a lot of animal agriculture in your region that may be threatening or contaminating water bodies, looking at the benefits of capturing that and getting it composted and more stabilized uh, or into and then into other markets um, may also be a wiser choice from a political economic standpoint. But again, the research on carbon is fascinating. And if you want to do a trial, I can share the um, I can share the format for the trials we did in California and Colorado. Fabulous. I know I'd be interested in seeing that and it looks like some folks um, that are listening also would. So we'll definitely uh, connect with you so we can maybe share that out um, afterwards. Uh, but another question, potentially maybe the last question before we move on, but um, could you mention uh, or touch on anything related to how we actually measure the carbon in soil? Is there a way for farmers or stewards of uh, land to do that themselves or does this need require a laboratory? Um. So one of the uh, one of the resources I put in the PowerPoint is a link to the Noble Institute's guide to in-field soil health, um, and it's really easy, like how to look at the color, the texture, the root growth of your soil, and understand sort of get a baseline of how it's doing from a health perspective. Um, a healthy soil is going to have more carbon in it, uh, so that's the way I would recommend um, folks really do that. Um, it is very hard to do carbon measurements as a farmer. If you want, if you want to really, there are a lot of people who are trying to work on in-field instruments. Um, but in my opinion, what happens with that is you actually get a lot of really bad data. Um, we had in California, there were the first year the Healthy Soils Program had farmers try to collect this data. It was essentially unusable from an academic perspective because the methods that were was conducted and gathered under were inconsistent. Um, there were a lot of errors and it ended up being sort of unusable in a literature sense or a scientific sense, which then made it kind of ineligible for to drive policy. So I guess, you know, the question is, why do you want to know about soil carbon? And if you want to know about it to change policy or to bring in new revenue streams, you really want to work with a scientist so that they can do the, you know, looking at 10 centimeters, 30 centimeters, 100 centimeters, um, looking at all the different variables alongside the carbon, looking at the carbon in the different fractions or different pools that exist in the soil, um, and really make sure that that data is really strong and that it's publishable. Um, and that's my recommendation from an advocate standpoint, and that you want scientifically valid information if you're gonna do all that process. If you're just looking to understand carbon in your own soil system, and if you're doing a good job managing for it, that Noble Institute is a good place to start, and there are a lot of other resources to look for indicators of soil health and carbon in your soil as a farmer. Um, but I would strongly discourage farmers from trying to figure out how to look at their soil carbon themselves outside of a partnership with a scientist or an academic institution. Great, super helpful. And if this is a, a quick answer, then we can address it now. And if not, maybe we can punt it to after the uh, second presentation, if you're still available. Um, I'm curious whether there's any update on com uh, compost application and other carbon amendments um, in the NRCS uh, conservation uh, stewardship program. There's a interim yeah. standard, is that correct? Yes. So um, based on the NRCS trials in California and other information from across the country, the NRCS has adopted what's called an interim practice standard for compost application. And that means that in some states, compost is an eligible conservation practice. So it's eligible for cost share via the NRCS. So if you work with your soil and water conservation district, your resource conservation district, um, and you could maybe apply for and receive money both to produce compost on site and to 
uh, buy compost um, through their cost share program. And that interim standard is open for public comment for the next two years. So if you uh, are a compost nerd, I would encourage you to read it because right now it needs a lot of work <laughs> and we need a lot of people who know what they're talking about it to comment on it because um, bureaucrats do not understand how compost works and there's a lot of education we have to do. So I think that's an important piece of advocacy if you're interested in it. Um, the other thing I would just say real quick on the understanding your soil carbon sequestration potential, you can use this tool called Comet Planner, C-O-M-E-T, planner and you can choose the county you're in and the types of practices you want to do in your soil and it will give you an estimate of the carbon benefits now that comet planner does not have compost in it yet because it only has um, finalized conservation practices and until that interim practice standard is finalized it will not be in that tool but when it is finalized you should be able to see estimates from it uh, by using that tool. Right now you can look at things like silver pasture, riparian restoration, and cover crops. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Cal Rose. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our second speaker. Um, and Okay, so Jean Bonital has worked at the Cornell Waste Management Institute in solid waste education for over 20 years beginning with the Cornell ex, uh, Cooperative Extension. Her work now focuses on food scrap, manure, and carcass and butcher waste composting education and research, determining value-added purposes for different streams of materials, promoting compost quality and consistency in the marketplace, and encouraging compost use to build healthy soils and redistribute nutrients. At this point, I'm gonna hand over the controls to Jean. All right, Jean, I think we can hear you now. On my control panel, there we go. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Great. Um, okay. Should we pull that? No. Okay. Should I go on from here? Yeah, go for it. Okay, good. Let me back up there. Hmm? Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be here to talk to you about soil qual compost quality and soil use. Um, I have, uh, on the website, I think we've put some some compost use posters, so you'll be able to go into the website and see those, and they're on all different topics from erosion control to garden use to farm use uh, to restoring wetlands and all different topics. So there, I think there are eight posters in there, um, and go ahead and and visit those posters. I will also share some of those slides with you in the presentation. So we gotta start, we're gonna talk quite a bit about quality and feedstocks, but we have to start from what do we actually need? What are the crop requirements and what's the soil testing? Um, we need to test soil nutrients. We need to look at organic matter. And can you have too much organic matter? pH, I'll add another one in here, uh, salinity or EC. Um, and you know, just know what their crop requir requirements are as you're adding compost or as you're amending your soils. Looking at, we look at different compost characteristics, and this happens to be one uh, where the feedstocks are dairy cow manure, wood chips, sawdust, leaf and yard waste. That's the, the ingredients. And these are the types of things. This is not an exhaustive list, 
But these are the types of things that we're looking for when we're looking for quality. Um, one of the things that I saw, one of the comments that I saw on the, um, the list of people that are on, from the list of people that are on the call, was we can tell what soil quality is or what compost quality is by looking at it, by feeling it, by smelling it. Um, and yes, all of those things definitely work, but we have to think about the feedstocks that we're using in order to know what we should be looking for. So we look for maturity, organic matter. We wanna look for weed seed, um, because we really don't wanna add a whole lot of weed seed to our, our, our soils and grow the weeds instead of growing the plants that we're targeting. Um, density, solids, carbon and nitrogen ratio, so that we don't have nitrogen, nitrogen sequestration issues with what we're applying and how we're applying it. Uh, conductivity, nitrogen, phosphorus, all our nutrients, so nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium, calcium, magnesium. We also, in a dairy compost, might be looking for some metals, and we just wanted to see what metals might be included, and that's gonna vary with every feedstocks compost. So looking for iron, zinc, arsenic, copper, cadmium, things like that. And I'll talk about each of these more specifically when I talk about different categories of, of feedstocks. And we also like to know what plant response is. Um, if we can do bioassays and know what our plant response is from the compost that we might be adding or the amendment we might be adding to the compost, I think that's really helpful. Jean, sorry to yes. interrupt. Could you hit the green button on your uh, presentation, uh, maybe to button. Screen? Upper, left, upper left hand corner? I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. The green button, yes. There Is you that go. better? Thank you. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so there are endless feedstocks, and feedstocks are just all the ingredients that we make compost out of. I've put, we, worked on making an exhaustive list of different things that people have asked some of us to comment on, compost, uh, amend with, etc. So look, just read through this and stare at it a little bit. Um, so one of my favorite is, you know, gummy vitamin residuals. You know, people are asking um, dog bone dust, you know, from making dog bones. What do we do with that? It's got other stuff in it. It's not just all edible. And, you know, there are just some real weirdos in here. And I challenge anybody that's on the call to add. Um, I'd love to see more. So you can put those in the chat. But um, this is just all the different feedstocks. And the ones in red are the ones that I'm going to talk about specifically. So leaf and yard residual. Um, what are the challenges with leaf and yard residual? Sometimes we say, well, it has garbage in it, a lot of garbage in it. Um, and that's only uh, based on what people rake to the curb. Um, because if you put your, your leaves out so they can be collected uh, and you put garbage in them, then that garbage is gonna get there. But leaf and yard waste doesn't always have garbage. However, we have had manhole covers in there and different things from collection of some of these residuals. So um, we could have glass, we could have things that are on the side of the road anyway and just scooped up. We may also have herbicides and pesticides and that's gonna be determined by, you know, what is sprayed in those areas, how many lawn care or lawn care, yard care, company service providers are working with uh, that property. Um, but they do, the herbicides, pesticides, most of them do tend to break down in the composting process. I will talk about a couple that may not, and that I'll do that in a little bit, a little bit later. Uh, we also might have lead. There's a lot of residual lead on our roadsides because of lead paint in signs, lead paint on roads, the striping on roads. 
Um, and we use leaded gasoline for a very long time. So some of that, it's gonna be in the form of a dust, very, very fine, but there can be lead. There actually can be higher lead in leaf and yard waste because of where it's collected than um, in most other most other composts that we're not looking for any that that you know lead hasn't been added to I should say um, salt levels we use road salts in different parts of the country um, to take care of our snow load and ice load so that um, is something that we also look for in look look at in yard waste and we want to keep track of these. We don't have to look so much for um, pathogens. We have less of those. And when we are composting, I'm gonna be talking mostly about thermophilic composting. So compost that has gone through a thermophilic process, has reached temperatures of 130 to 150, 60 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, and is truly composted. Uh, food scraps and food processing residuals. High in salt. You're going to see salt as a problem in most feedstocks. Um, generally, we're composting food that's been prepared um, pre and post plate, and it's mixed with other things, other materials, but uh, it can be high in salt because our diets are high in salt. So are dairy cows. I, uh, you know, their their diets are higher in salt. So that actually has to be able to leach out of the product um, before that is at a le level that's acceptable to a lot of plants. Uh, physical contaminants, uh, the ketchup wrapper, the, the um, half and half container, the plastic or nitrile or whatever glove uh, that, inevitably just gets thrown in there. Um, I've found some really nice bowls in a lot of food waste, you know, that I recover and silverware, hard, hard things that I just pull out. Um, it varies with the feedstock. Also serviceware can be a contaminant in food, food scrap and food processing residuals because we use it. And if we're using degradable serviceware, there's no guarantee that all of it is the same and all of it is equal. And generally when we're adding serviceware to a compost, we're adding some plastic. Even if it all breaks down and we can't see it, we are adding plastics to that. Uh, most, most serviceware is gonna be adding plastics to that compost. Um, in order to have an organic, compost or, or, or uh, uh, compost for organic use, no service wear can be added to that compost. Um, and that's just a rule uh, for Omri and Nofa. Manure composts, high in organic matter? Yes, no. Um, I put the question mark there because it does vary on how we're actually doing that composting, whether it's on a soil pad or an asphalt pad or a concrete pad or a cloth and gravel pad, um, different amounts of soil may be entrained in some of those. So the organic matter shows that it's lower, even if it's cow manure, you know. Uh, low in contaminants generally, quite low in contaminants. Low in garbage very little garbage. Uh, at one point, it was more common practice to throw sharps into the manure, um, but because we're reusing it, because it's going out on the fields, because of lots of reasons, we really don't want those, those um, contaminants in the compost. It can be high in phosphorus. So think about that. It high in N also, but high in phosphorus when we're applying it. And pharmaceuticals. A lot of the pharmaceuticals do break down, but we can have uh, a, a few things can linger, and we it depends on how well it's composted and at what temperatures. The higher temperatures don't always break the pharmaceuticals down uh, as quickly 
And we saw that with um, pentobarbital, as you heard, I do a lot of work with roadkill and um, uh, mortality waste, uh, disaster responses, all that kind of stuff. And if we've euthanized an animal, we use pentobarbital um, or, uh, or a like solution. And that breaks down better in a, in a mesophilic temperature, lower than 90 degrees Fahrenheit versus, um, versus the thermophilic temperatures. So we've got raw manure, composted manure. We can see, you know, just by seeing it, we can see the differences there. This is just a little bit, I wanted to share a little bit of quality stuff with you. This is all manure compost. And we have a large study of, of 25 uh, manure compost that we followed over a three year period and looked at the quality and consistency of those. And really the definition of compost was determined by the farmer. They needed to say, this is what I'm gonna use, whether it was 60% completed or or a hundred percent you know or or an, or an overly mature compost. It was what they wanted us to be testing because it's what they were using. So we look at pH oas um, and as you know with with manure, with uh, dairy manure, poultry manure, and we had some horse manure in here, those are we're gonna start with a raw manure of about eight point three to eight point six um, pH. And then as that mineralizes, as the process works, that's going much closer to neutral. If we added other materials, we might get a lower pH when we get to that, that finished product. Uh, organic matter, as I said, that really varies depending on what we are composting on. I think it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's better, <laughs> it's a good practice actually to compost on soil. Uh, because then we're we're including soil into those composts, and we actually get a good top topsoil mix that works really well on cropland. It's not a straight compost at that that point. It's uh, a topsoil blend, and that can be very helpful for a lot of reasons. It 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 helps with EC with the the salinity of things. Helps with pH. Um, and it, it does bring the organic matter down when you have entrained soil into those composts. Uh, we were looking at fecal coliform to see if it was problematic. And as I said, we were looking at most of these are, are very low fecal col coliform. There's one that's way off the, the uh, charts. And that one really was because it was sitting out in the field, it wasn't highly managed, and it was pretty immature at the point that we took. Um, those samples. We see another one that has really high, like everybody has really low uh, weed seed in their compost. And then we get to a nine, the 98 there. And that happened to be a compost mound or compost windrow that had weeds. I'm about five foot four, but the weeds were taller than I was. So, you know, if you if weeds are growing on your compost pile at that point, a lot of seed is going to go into the compost and they're going to say, wow, this is great stuff to grow in and you're going to have really good weed crop. So I always encourage people to make sure that your weed pressure is down by just keeping by by just good housekeeping, keeping your sites mowed um, and and maintained well because the weed seed will blow in and you will end up getting weed seed in if, if um, you're not paying attention. Um, I also have one metal slide because metals are one of those things that don't go away. Once we have them, once they're in the soils, um, they really don't move very far. I've seen uh, playgrounds that have lead arsenic in the wood um, only move about 12 inches in the in the soil column and that's out to the sides and and down so it doesn't go very far it's matter it stays it's it's there 
Um, so when we're applying and, and repeatedly applying, we have to be careful about our metals levels. And you'll see at the bottom, I have New York State. Um, oh, I thought I had the national ones in here. But there, the, the New York State 360s are close to the national limits for metals. Um, and you'll see, you know, everything is pretty good. But one of the things that we do use in a dairy compost, in a dairy, uh, dairy production, is copper sulfate. And copper sulfate can eventually become phytotoxic. So if we keep applying the same composts that are high in copper, we won't be able to grow anything. So we have to be careful about that, but you'll see there's, you know, anywhere from the higher ones are 529 to 777. And those copper, those, the copper is in there because of copper sulfate from foot baths. And it just ends up in the manure, the manure is composted and it, it's generally high in copper. So we do have to be careful about that with a manure compost, a dairy manure compost especially, because it is used pretty widely for hoof health um, on dairies. This is just a, 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 um, a chart, bar chart for organic matter in soils, and it shows you that the organic matter really is all over the, all over the map. But one of the things that we really want from a compost is the organic matter, because the organic matter is what provides the nutrients, the food for the microbes that we've been talking about earlier. So we want good organic matter. And I guess in my dreams, I would love to see the whole terrestrial earth have a layer of that three inches of organic matter placed over it because that would create a more sustainable system. We've burned by you by through agriculture, we've burned so much of the organic matter out of the out of the soils that we really need it. And the microbes can't live there, as Calla said, they really can't live there if there's no food value there. So it would be helpful for soil building to get, get our mat, organic matter into the soils so that there's a place for those organisms to be living and building soil for us. So, uh, we also compost fats, oils, and meats and high quality. We talk about the NPK in some of these and our meat waste compost or our mortality compost, roadkill composts. They have uh, an NPK of about 222. And that's pretty high, um, pretty high nutrient levels. So they grow things very well. We have fish waste compost that's about the same from our fisheries. Um, and if you can get a, get your hands on some of those composts, that can be very high nutrient and very good compost to be used in, used in some of your situa some of our situations. Physical contaminants very low um, and use limitations. Uh, that's something we're grappling with now because most of us weren't composting meat uh, for the most part. Now we do quite a lot of it because it's a good way of getting rid of our meat and mortality and diseased animals. We can sanitize it and, and use it. That's another seminar. So biosolids or you manure, human manure. Um, quality, do we wanna use it on our crops? Um, I'm gonna say we really don't wanna use it on most of our crops, um, on our food crops because it varies. It's our main regulated compost. So there are protections put in place for us, but it's still one of those that, you know, you can have a pocket of something someplace that can be a problem. And I do still, because we process our compost and we know that we've killed our pathogens and we test for that, I still worry about, um, about metals more than I worry about, heavy metals more than I worry about um, bacteria and viruses because we can take care of them, those for the most part. 
but we can have inerts in them. Uh, the difference between human manure and dairy manure, I don't think I don't know if anybody knows that, and I won't wait for an answer. But the difference between the two, the fingerprint there is we have plastics in our manure, in human manure, and the cows don't have much plastics in their manure. And that's from synthetic fiber, it's from all the things that we flush, and it is our fingerprint. Um, so we are by with using biosols, we are putting more plastic into the environment, more more plastics there, even if they're microplastics and things that we can't see. Chemical contaminants, you know, biosolids are anything that's put down the drain. There's not a lot of control. And we do look at the industry, uh, at industry, but it's one of those things that we, we need to pay attention to a lot. Uh, bacteria, viruses, as I said, they're killed. Um, drugs, legal and illicit, legal and illegal drugs. We have to, do they all break down? We don't always know that. We don't look for a lot of those components in biosolids even. So uh, change in feedstock, it's pretty consistent. Uh, very, very varied, but pretty consistent. Um, and use limitations. There are use limitations for biosolids compost. So. Um, I think that's in the wrong place. Sorry about that. So enough about quality and more about use. Um, Cornell Waste Management Institute, which I'm part of, has maps. So we have maps for compost sites and wood chip sites. And they're interactive maps, so you can see what's going on. There is also a US Compost Council find a composter map that you can Google and you can get into there and you can put in your state, you can put in feedstocks, you can put in other things and you can find different composts that would be in your area for use. So I think it's important to know these things, how do we access them? And the more information you can get about the compost, the better. Um, different trials, these are just some compost use and this is actually paper fiber used on corn. And this one is just, we're looking at the corn trials. They, we, we put paper fiber on them and looked at those and actually things were very good in those trials. Um, this is some of the analytes that we looked at when we were looking at the, the soils, when we analyzed the soils. Um, and I just want to look at the um, paper residuals, PR, char, and, and just this is what we're looking for. We've been talking about these right along. Um, and you can read these, read across and see these, but it tells all the things that we were looking for so that we can match them up and make sure that we're not contaminating and that we're providing benefit. Um, the unlined unlined paper mill fiber actually worked out really well and did not sequester any of the nitrogen that we were, we were a little bit worried that it could sequester some of the nitrogen it didn't um, as it was top dressed onto the soil. Um, this is agriculture, gardens, all that. Um, this is uh, some work that I was working on in Kenya and we were actually microdosing um, the the amendments into the into the furrows. So what we do is we had um, actually vermicompost was one of the one of the amendments and biochar were put into the furrow and then the plants are set into them. As I said, I'd love to see a lot of compost spread around, but there wasn't a lot of compost to spread around. And if we put that seed in the bed in that furrow, then it can access those nutrients more readily. And we had great, um, this is dry bean production from, from those amendments. And really it's not a lot that's put in the furrow, it's a sprinkle because number one, it's vermicompost and biochar and those were the two things that we didn't wanna overload the plants. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about compost uh, erosion control stuff, so compost socks. 
these compost socks are used in um, used around drains and stuff like that to keep all of the the particulate matter and everything out of our water supply, and that's very important. It filters anything that's going through there, and it doesn't go into our storm drains. These are compost socks. We've blown that the blower truck was in the. I don't think I talked about that enough. The blower truck was in there. We blow um, chips or straw or uh, compost into these socks. And then we, in this case, we're trying to keep this ditch from going back into that, that uh, vegetated area. And we pin those into the, into the um, banks so that we could hold the banks. And then the grass grows over those. A couple of other places. Uh, this is a culvert that goes under the road here, and it was going back towards other things that were above this, like telephone poles and power power generation areas. And we needed to keep this area from from undercutting. So we pinned again some socks in there, and this is four months later. And you can't see that, but the water goes right under there. It hasn't taken the socks out. Uh, the socks just are in there. They filter water and they allow us to stabilize those ditches and banks. Another roadside ditches. Um, this is an area that was a very steep hill and it's going into a class one stream that you'll see in a second, and that's how the ditch works. So there wasn't anything we could change about that except to put in some socks to filter some of the materials there. Um, so we pin those socks into place, then you know rain comes, it moves things down. The class one stream is on the other side of this uh, sock, so we put an extra large sock in there to filter everything, and it worked out really well. Kept everything out of the streams, this that stream that's there, and you know sediment and any pollution that might be going into that stream. This was a mitigated wetland in the Adirondack Park. It was a landfill and they needed to mitigate it. So they, they took the landfill out of there. They, they mined all the trash out and recycled what they could and re-landfilled what they couldn't and then rebuilt the wetland. So they have wet areas. We had to, we did a 50-50 a mix with um, the soil mixes. We really wanted a lot of fiber in there because a bog or a wetland is going to have a lot of fiber. And then we put in uh, native plants that would be able to um, sustain this wetland. So you can't see too many of the natives in there, but there are willows, there's you know, um, some other bog plants that will be put in later down the road so that they can get established in this area. Um, this is more, we're actually creating blankets or using the compost as a blanket. So we're spraying it on this highly erodible area and then that area gets seeded down. Um, this is a small blower operation. It um, We've put in socks, so that would slow down a lot of the sediment that would go into there and everything would be stabilized. We use a lot of uh, filter strips and filter strips, are, there are specifications for filter strips in, um, in NRCS and soil and water conservation specs. And they really help us a lot to keep nutrients from going places we won't, don't want them to go. So planting a filter strip, mowing it, harvesting it, uh, whatever is a good management practice for compost sites, for farms, for garden areas, for all of those things. Jean? This is another, yes. 
just uh, wanted to leave a few minutes for questions. So I don't know, another minute or two. Okay, I will wrap up. So this is um, an area that was cut away late in the fall and we needed to get it vegetated. So we put in socks, blankets, and that's how that came out. And it's beautiful. This is some stream bank work where we put natives into those stream banks so that it would hold those banks. I'll skip that one. This is uh, use of biosolids compost where they're using it on very steep slopes. That's a one-to-one -one slope. And Texas is a tough place to be growing grass, but their aquifers were in real trouble. So they really needed to get vegetation in there. And that's what it looked like eight months later. Um, this is roadkill compost, three inch blanket put down, um, seeded down and took care of the roadsides, low pu public contact areas. I'm gonna go in here, I think this is one of the last ones, but tree planting. 50-50 um, mixes back into the holes of, of trees, of a lot of our trees, uh, especially the deciduous. Uh, this is three years of maples without amendment, and this is three years with amendment. And I'll just click back and forth there, but it made such a tremendous difference um, to have the compost in those holes and really move things forward. Uh, so, and that is, um, that's the end of the presentation. So I encourage you to go back to the, to the posters and look up the posters because they'll take all of that, give they give you more specific information on on how much and use and things like that. So um, get into those and go from there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jean. Uh, that was a great presentation. A couple of questions. Um, one would be uh, there are a few questions about what. Uh, material you use to make the compost sacks, like what holds the material together, and how long does it take for the socks to break down? A lot of the socks are um, synthetic material, so they really don't break down. They become part of the landscape, and that's a place where, since it's generally banks, and it's really going to take a very long time because the roots grow into there and everything grows right into that and it makes it part of the environment. They're not, they're going to impart plastic into the environment, but less of it. I have heard that there are some degradable socks. I have not used the degradable socks because we're really trying to stabilize areas and this helps with stabilizing. And we generally, sometimes in the ditches, we will pull those socks back out every couple of years if if it needs to happen. But generally, we can get away with not doing that. So, Great. Uh, a question that came up about um, antibiotics in manure compost and whether uh, whether that's a concern and if it's avoidable. And it's avoidable. Um, uh, most of the antibiotics work has been done on biosolids and most of them break down pretty cleanly. We have not looked at all of them and I have not looked at them in biosolids at all. I look at them more in animal waste, um, but most of those seem to be breaking down. I can't guarantee that all are breaking down, but I think it's worth looking at the specific antibiotic and seeing if there's any work on that to make sure that you're not causing a problem there. Got it, uh, more research to do there. Um, a question about um, if a farmer has a little bit of compost, is it better to spread it over a wide acreage or to apply a thick layer to a small area? And I'm sure that depends on a few things. For know. the most part, I would I would spread it around. I, I would create that blanket and the more evenly in the in any dairy areas we generally are spreading raw manure and we want to make sure that we're spreading that raw manure in a blanket it's not our best management practice i'd rather see it uh, composted but 
it is a, a practice that we use very widely and it, it does work as long as it doesn't rain right after we apply it or we don't lay put it between snow low layers or things like that so um i would say just the short answer to that is to spread it not to concentrate it great and i guess one last question um any observed effect of chlorinated water on compost in any of the research you've done um no i'm gonna say no we haven't really looked at that and i'm gonna say it's probably gonna off gas so it's going to become part of the environment and not part of the compost um, but i i can't guarantee that answer is is correct you might see some higher dioxin in from chlorinated water there may be a little bit of dioxin formed in there i i don't i don't know great well more questions to be looked into but thank you so much jean for that great presentation and thank you Calarose, rose for yours um, we're going to close it out here so thank you all for participating and we look forward to sharing the recording for this with you in a couple of days take care everyone thank you Thank you.